And so we're continuing our study of Chuck Swindoll's book, Moses, a Man of Selfless Dedication. Today we're going to cover two chapters, chapter six and chapter seven, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the two topics, as well as the narrative, are so intertwined that it'd be uh, tough to pull them apart. So burning bushes and second chances, and then who? Me, Lord? Last week, we covered those 40 years. It took eight verses for us. It took one hour. And Moses went from sitting at the well to being called to the bush. Lessons learned. Experience promotes obedience. It prompts teachability. It teaches humility. And of course, especially for us guys, if all else fails, read the instructions. The Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. In that process, Moses came up with a new mindset. He, he had a servant's attitude. He was willing to be obscure as opposed to the heir apparent to the throne in Egypt. And he learned to rest and rely on God. And we talked about obscurity, solitude, time, and discomfort. We used that word content, and we said he was content in the land of contention, in the land of Midian. And we borrowed a verse from Paul. He says, I have learned to be content. And of course, Moses had to learn that as well. But I want you to take a look at the two sides of a coin as it relates to contentment. On the one hand, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Moses had the ultimate midlife crisis. His crisis was the death of that Egyptian. Now we're fast forward 80 years, and did his mind dwell on that event? We don't know, but we know that he was content. He learned to be content. Here's the other side of that coin, our comfort zone. We could become so content that we forget that I don't care how old you are, God always challenges us to grow and to do. And so I can learn to be content, but do I fall into a rut, the rut of my comfort zone? So second chances in the Bible. Abraham was a liar. He said to Pharaoh, she, he said to Abimelech, she's my sister. Jacob was a chiseler and a cheat. He talked Esau out of his birthright. He did some interesting things to gain all of the sheep from Laban. But when God addresses Moses, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what he's saying is, I'm the God of men who have failed. Who in this room has never failed? I've never failed. Of course, I've never told a lie. He's the God of second chances. Rahab was a harlot, and yet her, her name appears in the hall of faith. Mark was a quitter, yet he was helpful toward the end. Now, I want you to notice how he was helpful. He wasn't there as a, an aide to Paul because Paul was ailing. That was Luke's job. He was there. He was useful for the ministry. He went from quitter, useful for the ministry. What about us? How many second chances do we get, whether we're talking about from God or with one another? Seven verses 490. And you see these verses. Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Well, that's the ESV and the NIV, and the King James says 490 times. So which is it? It goes all the way back to Genesis, and the Septuagint translated that 490, verses 77. They say, well, then, of course, then the New Testament, that must mean 77. In your study Bibles, if you've got one that says 77, it'll say 
other translations or other manuscripts or other things will say 490 and the vice versa is also true. So what did Jesus mean when he said what he said? Okay. We do know that during the New Testament times, people were quoting the Septuagint, which is where the 490 came from. We know that because when Stephen was testifying of how many people went down to Egypt in the first place, there was a discrepancy in the number 70 versus 72. So what did Jesus mean when he said, forgive X times? By the time the New Testament rolled around, the phrase seven times 70 became a common phrase for until the end of time. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm not going to forgive you just once. I'm going to forgive you till the end of time. Of course, then you say, well, if you have to count up to seven, did you even count to number one? Keeping in mind the Chuck Swindoll definition of forgiveness is giving up the right to remember. So the burning bush. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father Jethro. 40 years working, didn't have his own sheep yet. He was definitely bottom of the barrel. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. Now, that word is akar, which means back. And any other time that word akar shows up in scripture, they're talking about behind. So where did west come from? In the mind of the Jew, anytime they talk about directions, when you're looking forward, you're looking to the east. And so if it's the back side of the desert, it's the west side of the desert. And if you look at a map, there's Midian. And over on the west side is the Sinai Peninsula. And that's where Moses, <laughs> and that's where Moses meets up with God. Now, there's an interesting photograph. It is Mount Horeb. And you see in the bottom, there's a monastery that was built around 300 A.D., by Constantinople, Constantine's mother, Helena, who built all kinds of shrines in, in the Mideast. But I wanted to draw your attention to the vegetation. Now that vegetation is there with the monastery. They, they built the monastery there because that was supposedly the spot of Moses and the burning bush. And the, the, there were other bushes there that didn't burn. And that meant there was water somewhere, which meant they dug a well. And so they have those bushes there. We're going to come back to the bushes in a second. Moses goes to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, we studied Jacob a few months ago, and Jacob didn't just visit Bethel the second time. He got to visit El Bethel, the God of the house of God. Here's where Moses, 40 years in keeping this sheep, and I'll spill the beans now. He went up there because there is a plateau there that has vegetation during the hottest months. And so he did like an annual pilgrimage. He was up there. He went to the mountain of God. But on this particular day, he gets to meet the God of the mountain of God. Now, you see that 8651? That's the height of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is one peak of the Horeb mountainous area. So he was somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 feet up. 5,000 is, you know, Denver, the mile high city, because it happens to be 5,280 feet above sea level. He was up there, but I think it looks maybe more like that, as opposed to all those bushes concentrated in one area, You've got a little bit in the foreground. You've got some in the background. And the Bible never tells us how many sheep Moses was keeping. But we do know that Jethro had a bunch because when he met Jethro, he had seven daughters who had to take care of all those sheep. Now, there's no fence out there. The sheep are here and the sheep are there. And all of a sudden, Moses is keeping an eye on the sheep. And what does he see? 
this burning bush. Any deer hunters out there? You'll be sitting there and you'll be looking in the beginning when dawn, you see this thing and say, I, I know that's a deer's tail. And by the time the daylight comes, it's some leaf that the wind just kind of tickles along. But you're looking and all of a sudden, pow, there's the deer. Where did it come from? I picture that like the burning bush. If it happened that way, I don't know. But there's Moses. He's still and he's watching these sheep and all of a sudden, poof, there's this burning bush. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. I will turn aside. He was focused on his sheep. He's focused on the landscape. He's focused on where they're going to get their next meal. And now he turns aside to see this great sight. <clears throat> the next verse, when the Lord saw, that's tied the when and the then, verse five. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, now, you know, that's we're gonna see a slide later on. It says the bush is God's attention getter. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. There's no commitment there. He just says, you know, here I am. I can remember as a kid, we went to camp. We'd gather around the flagpole and they'd ask each cabin, is every kid there? And you'd say, all present or accounted for, sir. I'm here. I went to school and they'd take roll and say, present. Here's some other responses when God called. Samuel, he was a little boy. He says, speak for thy servant heareth. He was committed to hearing the message. This is Isaiah. Here I am, send me. He was committed to go. This is Paul. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He was ready to gain information, gain some insight. But all Moses said was, here I am. The burning bush. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now, first of all, this is the first recorded of God, recording of God's word, God's words for over 400 years. The last time God spoke to man was when he was talking to Jacob. He never spoke to Joseph. He never spoke to any of his brothers. He didn't speak to any of those kids. He didn't speak to Amram and Jochebed. By faith, they did what they had to do. This is the first time in over 400 years that God's voice is recorded. Do not come near. Take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. Today, God uses his word, his people, and the events in our lives to speak to us. It's the first use of the word holy in the Bible, which also means separated. And Moses is about to be separated from his first 80 years. 40 years in the courts of Pharaoh, 40 years in the backside of the desert, and he's now in a conversation getting prepped for those next 40 years. He has been separated from the last 80 years. And also, this will be the first set of miracles done by a man. Adam didn't perform any miracles. Abraham, Father Abraham, didn't perform any miracles. Moses is the first. So, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is chapter 3. And when you study the life of Moses, chapter 3, the burning bush and Mount Sinai, the giving of the, the uh, Ten Commandments is less than a year. It's 40 years wilderness, but less than a year. So we're going to contrast Moses' relationship with God in chapter 3 versus chapter 34, which was less than a year later. There's chapter 3. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Verses the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with, stood with him there 
and proclaim the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him, and Moses bowed quickly his head toward the ground and worshiped. You see the difference there? There was a fellowship there. There wasn't a fear there. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. This is Matthew's gospel. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, this passage is right in line, chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. We studied it with Pastor Tony leading us. Mark and I are studying it in a Friday uh, Bible study right now. In the face of do your prayers in secret, give your alms in secret, let your light so shine. So what light is that? Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. Why was it shining? Because he had been talking with God. His, light, his face wasn't shining because he just survived uh, 80 days without food and water. His face was shining because he talked with God. So, Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. He spent roughly... 14,600 days of shepherding. Now, I don't know how diverse a shepherd's life could be. I mean, you've got times when they're having babies and you've got times when they're breeding and you've got times when they're lost and to study the, the, the 99 sheep and the one, but it's a pretty monotonous job. 14,600 days of monotony. And then all of a sudden, he sees this burning bush. Talking about his second coming, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what were the days of Noah like? They were just like any other day. You get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, you read your newspaper if that's what you do. You, you, you put out the dog, you feed the cat. Whatever you do, you do it again and again and again. And then one day, Jesus is coming back. Now, I talked to you about contentment. And I talked about the comfort zone. One day, Jesus could get your attention. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. And I know their sufferings. God knows every detail. The Bible says he stores up our tears in a bottle. He knows everything. And he cares. And I have come down. Forty years earlier, Moses would have said, I'm the deliverer. Even my name is deliverer. What are you talking about? God says, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God's doing it all. He just likes to use human instruments, and that's us. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, Moses might be thinking, you know, that's terrible. Maybe the Lord will finally do something. But the Lord's going to talk about doing it through him. He says, come, versus go. We're going to get to the go in a little bit. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, the punchline of this is going to be sometimes we get the go in front of the come. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Did Moses go through a learning experience? Yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am weak and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. The go follows the come. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It wasn't go, uh, it wasn't come, I'm going to prep you and then go. I'm just going to stay up here in the heavenlies. He says, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's an interesting translation when it comes to Noah going on to the ark. King James said it had it right. When he was invited to the ark, it was come. Modern translations say go into the ark. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So then here comes this really interesting dialogue. Come, I will send you. Who, me? You're kidding. I'll be with you. By the way, who are you anyway? God's response, and you have the paperwork. I am who I am. Yahweh is made up of certain consonants from hebrew there were no vowels at the time they used little squiggles and things to try to help then that came later it was just the letters at some point the romans wanted to translate this is uh pre-vulgate in between the vulgate and the septuagint and they came up with jv j h v h yah jehovah and it stuck the name is yahweh they'll listen to you Think about it. No, they won't. Now, I put the King James up here just to have a little bit extra humor. Keep in mind, in the book of Acts, it says he's mighty in word and deed. I could almost read this, let alone say it. I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. I think he was still mighty in word. There's a bona fide excuse. You're right. Who made that mouth? Please send someone else. Those were Moses' responses. What about ours? What kind of response did we come up with? We run before we are sent. We retreat after we fail, and we resist when we're called. Just like most. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us these things are written for our instruction, and there are examples. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled. I see that verse, and I think of the movie The Wizard of Oz, and there's this little guy behind the curtain says, This is the great Oz. And the lion is going like this. <laughs> the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. He knew that Moses could too. I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. Why did Aaron wait 40 years to come meet his brother? I don't know. Seems like our families, as a general rule, tend to drift apart. And in fact, I'll just be, say this about my own biological family. Uh, we don't get together very often. One of my sisters is trying to get us all together. And she said, I hope the next time we get together is not for a funeral. Seems like that broader family gets together only for weddings and funerals. I will tell you, don't let that happen. Today is opening day of the NFL, at least for the Eagles. Everybody's getting together at our house. All 13 grandchildren, everybody. Don't let that drift. He says, I'm coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. 
Now we've read last week that Moses' strength was not abated. That doesn't say that Aaron's strength wasn't abated. Here's this crotchety old guy. He marches, he's 83 years old. He marches across the desert to find his brother. And can you imagine when the two meet, Aaron's looking at Moses and he's saying, hey, you're looking pretty spry. And Moses said, yeah, you are my older brother. He'll be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach both of you what to do. And he will speak for you to the people. Now, keep in mind, the people haven't seen Moses for 40 years, in some cases, 80 years, because he was around as a baby and then gone. Aaron is current events. Aaron's going to bring Moses back and he's going to say, hey, here's my, my brother. Remember my baby brother? This is him. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as a God to him. He was a little brother, but he was looking up to his little brother. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Now, take in your hand this staff. Between verse 2 and verse 20, the staff changes. Verse two, and the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. It's the staff of Moses. By the time verse 20, and Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. What do the jawbone the slingshot, and a little boy's lunch have in common. The key word is common. You've got a decaying donkey. You've got a piece of leather with some leather, leather strings attached to it. And you've got a little boy's lunch. And you've got a shepherd's staff. The difference is... When they're being used by God, they can do extraordinary things. The bush, that's God's attention getter for Moses. You know, things don't just happen. We use this phrase, good luck, right? No, there's no luck. There's no coincidence. You read the story of Esther and... Things just, they couldn't make up that story. The plot, the storyline is so intricate. Things just don't happen. What's it going to take to get our attention? In Moses' case, it was the bush. Now, in this dialogue, Moses is, uh, God is going to point to three things of Moses' anatomy. First, his feet. Take off your sandals for this is holy ground. And he's basically asking the question, where are you? Moses turned aside. God got his attention. And the first point is, where are you? What are you doing with your life? You still want to keep sheep after 40 years? You're 80 years old, Moses. You want to do something for me? Where are you? I'm saving the middle for a little bit later on. His mouth. Moses, God said to Moses, who made that mouth? That's what are you thinking? Where are you? What are you thinking? But then his hands, he says to him, what is that in your hand? What are you doing? And what have you got? What's that particular hand called? The full house. You must be a heathen. <laughs> That's a full house. What's in your hand? Maybe it's a family where you do have a full house. Maybe you're an empty nester. Maybe you don't have a nest at all. 
Maybe you've got health. That's that's one of my assets. Maybe you've got a job. Maybe you don't have a job, but you've got plenty of resources. Maybe you've got wisdom. There are different kinds of assets. There are different kinds of things that we've got. Or maybe lack thereof. Who's that lady? Jane, you can't answer. Who's that lady? That's Johnny Erickson Tata. There's a picture of her in her younger days. She was in a swimming accident. She dived into some shallow water. She hit a submerged rock and she was became a, parapo, parapole, a quadriplegic. Now I learned some interesting trivia about her this week. Her dad, Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y, 1932 alternate to the US Olympic team for wrestling. Member of the National Wrestlers Hall of Fame. If Chris Byler was sitting back there, it's also important to note, he was the number one hardwood guy in the city of Baltimore. He blew out his knees between spending the time doing the hardwood and, and arthritis. And uh, he was confined to first a cane and then uh, crutches years before he should have had that kind of a problem. And when she was in the hospital and they were trying to put her back together, she said, I was inspired by the sound of the clicking of the crutches as they were coming to my room. And she said, the verse, keep in mind we're talking about resources or lack thereof. The verse that got her attention as she listened to her dad coming was, was blessed are the feet of those that bring good news. So there's a young lady. Her dad was a common person. She had no silver spoon, if you will. She had no advanced education. She was a teenager. I don't expect you to read all that stuff, but those are the different awards that she accumulated over time. There's a lady that has no resource, if you will, and yet accomplished great, great things. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses, remember that place where you failed miserably? The most powerful man in the government wanted you dead and the people threatened to squeal on you. I want you to go back there and do exactly what you tried to do before. God didn't ask Moses how he felt about it. He simply told him to, to go. God's call is not multiple choice. It's well-defined. And there's only one right answer. So Moses' excuse, number one, what if they ask me who sent me? Number two, what if they don't believe me? Number three, I'm slow of speech. And then finally, no more excuses, but just, oh, please send somebody else. I'd like to draw your attention to the handouts. Uh, pull out your pens. If you didn't bring one, you're not fully prepared. <laughs> You'll see one name of all those names that's in red. I'd like you to do something like put a star or a check mark next to that. I found that very interesting that the name Joshua is really a contraction of that much larger name. And so when you study the names of Jehovah, the names of Yahweh, we'll get to Jehovah in a little bit. When you study the names of Yahweh, you have uh, common ones like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. Uh, but that one I thought was interesting, Jehovah saves, Jehovah our salvation. You come to the New Testament, and that'll be the, the latter part of your study. And again, you see all those different quotes from John's gospel. Next to all of that, I am, just write John on there. Not this John, the Apostle John, okay? And then ultimately in John chapter 18, when the uh, soldiers are coming to take Jesus, Jesus says to them, whom do you seek? 
And the response is Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus says, I am. Because the he is not in the transcript. It's not in the manuscript. It was added. And when you open up your scriptures, you'll see that that's in italics. So I am. And they all fell. And one last uh, New Testament notion, uh, and I think that's on the handouts as well. Before Abraham was, I am. And God's response, I want you. Now, we're not going to go through these. Those were all in the handouts. And I wanted to come to this, John chapter 18. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked him, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. He replied, I am he. The italics are not mine. The red is mine. Anytime in your English Bible you see something in italics, that means the word is not in the original. It's there to help us understand. There's a photograph of that passage in my Bible. We had handouts that I gave out and I asked everybody to take out their pen and mark them up. The reason I did that is this. If you have a handout and you get somebody to write on it, there's like a 50% greater chance that that person's going to keep it. Okay. This is a Bible. It's a pew Bible. And my guess is there's not a single pen mark inside this pew Bible. I would encourage you in your Bibles to write in it. I would never write in my Bible. When you write in your Bible, that becomes your Bible. The Bible I'm carrying right now is now in its 40th year, it's just from August of uh, 1983 until now in September 2023. That is my Bible. Elizabeth said, Dad, when you're gone, there's only two things I want, your guitar and your Bible. If it was just a pew Bible, they, they wouldn't care less about that particular one. I would encourage you to make it your Bible. So I want you, Moses. Why me versus why not me? We should have a certainty that it's God's voice. Not simply us trying to accomplish our own desires. Here's an interesting point. The quotes are there because this came straight from Swindoll. I can't add to this. Too many people try to figure out what God is saying without looking at what he has already said. Confidence in God's power. Work and trust in his power, not mine. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Jars of clay, inanimate, common, Another verse, Paul talks about be, uh, being jars for honor and for dishonor. I would say for, you know, the finest, finest china versus the overnight pot. Honor, dishonor. God uses people in all different kinds of ways. And then finally, comfort with his plan. I'm willing to receive what he gives. I'm willing to lack what he withholds. I'm willing to relinquish what he takes. I'm willing to suffer what he inflicts. And I'm willing to become what he requires. Now go. He says, now therefore go and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Now we're blessed in this country thus far. Where religious persecution is subtle as opposed to getting beaten up or getting killed or getting thrown in prison or whatever. But I will tell you that speaking of your faith is threatening to many people. Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, I'm not ashamed of the glorious gospel of Christ. 
it could be intimidating to strike up a conversation. But I want you to look at, don't be anxious about it. Whatever God gives you, it's not you that's speaking, it's the Holy Spirit that speaks. We're going to end on that note. God is calling each and every one of us to do something beyond the comfort zone. We need to be willing to hear his word and then follow through.